I remember the first time I taught her to sign. <laughs> <laughs> she was a quick learner. She picked it up quick. <laughs> I, I am only kidding. <laughs> Please trust me. I, I'm only kidding. I, I want to welcome our online um, guest. This one particular online guest. I know my family is connected to first service, but we have a special family from South Africa that's watching right now. Lizani and Johan um, Muller is their name. Um, I'm going to read a letter that Lazani had sent me back just before Christmas. I asked her permission. I got a chance to meet them online Skype this past week. I Skyped them, and, and we talked um, from South Africa this past week. Wonderful, sweet, kind couple. Let me read you this letter, and we're going to launch into um, the rest of the service here. Dear Pastor Kelly, sort of lengthy, bear with me. It's pretty compelling. I'm sure you receive a lot of messages, and I really appreciate you taking your time to read this one. I came across your website after I, after I searched pastors who have lost a child. I want to thank you for honesty, for your honesty, and even though you are so, so heartbroken, you are still able to focus on God. I am so sorry for your loss. I would like to share a story with you. I have some questions. I hope I can maybe try, you can maybe try to help me find the answers if possible. My husband and I live in South Africa. We've been married for eight years. I tried to fall, um, get pregnant six years ago. After two years of trying, I got pregnant with insemination. We were so happy and grateful towards God. But then at 10 weeks, I had a miscarriage. We were devastated. I walked a long road to come to a point to trust God again, that I would ever get pregnant again, and that I would actually have a full-term pregnancy. Because I have a, a uterus abnormality, it is said that the chances of getting pregnant naturally were very small, but we still never lost hope. Two years after we lost our baby, I got pregnant naturally. We were so happy, and whenever I got a chance, I testified of the greatness of God and how he answers prayers. On December 11, 2013, I gave birth to a beautiful little boy named Leon. When he was three months old, he started to refuse his milk, didn't gain weight, and when I started with solids, he refused to eat. We went to several doctors, but they couldn't tell us what was going on, and they gave him a peg tube so they could feed him directly into his stomach. A week after we got home from a two-week stay in the hospital, he started to vomit and choke. We went back to the hospital, and they did hundreds of tests, but everything came back normal. After two weeks, they suggested to do a laparoscopy. if I said that right. I know I didn't, but you know what I'm talking about. And a bronchoscopy, which after his lungs collapsed. We had to watch for 20 minutes how they struggled to keep my baby alive. He was then in ICU for four weeks on a ventilator. In the four weeks he was in ICU, he had three life-threatening events. His heart stopped beating twice. We went through hell. There were so many people praying with us and trusting God for a miracle. Leon actually started to get better, and they were going to take him off the ventilator. We stopped praying and trusted God that our baby was going to be fine. But on the 24th of October, 2014, our 10-month-old baby died. I sat next to him, and I prayed, God, please don't take my baby. And the more I prayed, the slower his heartbeat went. Then when it was over, our baby was gone. The doctors still don't know why. We waited four years for our baby just to be taken away. Pastor Kelly, my faith is shaken. Everything I believe is shattered in a thousand pieces. How will I ever be able to trust God again? What difference does it make if I pray or not? 
if he's already decided what is going to happen and what isn't going to happen. Why will God answer any other prayer if he didn't answer me standing next to my child while he was dying? Please, if possible, give me something practical to help restore my trust in God and help me to believe in the power of prayer again. It's been a year now since he passed away. We went for fertility treatment. I just found out I'm pregnant. I saw the sonogram. On the 11th of December, they found out Liam was supposed to be two years old. But it is so difficult for me to pray and believe that it's going to be okay. How can you tell? Even Because even though we prayed and trusted and asked in Jesus' name and we laid our hands on our son, the answer was no. I really need help from somebody. From, let me reread that. I really need help from someone who really knows how it feels to be confronted with the other side of God. That side which no church or pastor ever speaks about. How did you manage to trust God again after your dear daughter passed away? Sorry to bother you with this. I wish I could just fly over there and join your church. Me too, Lazani. Me too. I miss church and I miss being in a close relationship with God. Thank you so much for your time. Please excuse my English for I am Africans speaking. She speaks better English than me. That's not to say no. And that's not that hard, but she still speaks better English than me. This morning I want to speak on a subject, Grace 401, uh, taking a line out of her letter on the other side of God. I, I'll just do a disclaimer right now. I don't have some of those answers, Lazani. I, I'm still finding them. I'm still seeking them. I'm on a journey that I get, it seems like, incremental grasp of. I'm still seeking. I'm still knocking. I have not figured it out. I have, have been asked that question more than once. Why do we even pray? I have a really simple answer. It may be way too simple, but it's the only answer I have is because God asked us to. Is he going to do what he's going to do anyway? I, you have to ask him. I, I'm asked to pray, so I pray. I'm asked to seek, so I seek. I'm asked to knock, so I knock. I, I have no real understanding of the sovereignty of God. And I want to say this message can become a message on God's sovereignty. Um, pretty easy, but it's not going to. I'm not going to speak about that today. But if you want to know more about that or hear a message on that, 2013 in December, I spoke a message just on that, the sovereignty of God in relation to what happened to me and other folks. You can, that will be posted on Facebook. It's already in the archives on YouTube. You can look that message up, and I recommend if you wrestle with some of those questions, because this is going to be more about loss more than that. But that addresses some of those questions in that, in that particular message. So if we're going to champion the, the message of God's grace, and I believe we're compelled to by the scriptures, then we can't do it in a religious, churchianity type of way. There needs to be stark, brutal honesty. Because life is stark and life is brutal. And slapping some bumper stickers on some Christian slogans on something won't fix anything if it isn't based in Christ and his word. So we embrace and we should embrace Romans 5.2 that says we stand in grace. We embrace and we should embrace Ephesians 2.8 which says we're saved by grace. We, should, we embrace and we should embrace the God of all grace in 1 Peter 5.10. We should embrace the fact that God accepts us as is, then takes, up, takes on the job of making us more like him, Philippians 1.6. We, we love these things. We should accept the fact, and we do, that the grace of God calls me to live godly life like we saw last week and then compels me to do good works. And those are all wonderful understandings of the grace of God, none that are being cheapened at all by what I say today. But what about when you find yourself facing 
unspeakable loss and tragedy. But what about grace when you're paralyzed with fear and crippling sadness? What about grace when you are powerless to change anything? You are devoid of natural strength. You're devoid of physical and emotional strength. What do we do with that? How about grace when God not only seems detached, but he's silent and it seems like he's almost indifferent to the hell I'm living in on earth, to the pain. Well, what about grace when you beg God for the life of one you love so deeply? A love that he put in our hearts. You believe in his power. You believe in his love. You trust in prayer. You proclaim you're his child. Yet the prayer remains unanswered. And even his presence seems disconnected. This, my friends, is the other side of God. And when we cross this chasm, and it's a journey, it's not, it doesn't happen with one sermon, trust me. It happens with seeking, knocking, and asking. It will bring your understanding of who God is to another level. Outside of the level of religion, and churchianity, as I like to call it, into the dirt and the grime and the trenches of life. God wants our faith to be real. And thorough. No. Now that I've got you all happy. <laughs> um, Paul, that's the apostle, in Second Corinthians chapter 12, interesting chapel. I read it this morning, actually, in my own private devotions. Um, he was facing inexplicable pain. We'll talk about that in a moment. But when you look at the first part of Second Corinthians chapter 12, we all like to quoting verses 9, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's what we like to, but when you look at the first part of the chapter, he's talking about this experience that he had with God. He had this experience where God ushered him into the third heavens. He goes, I don't know if I was awake or I was asleep. I don't know if I was in a spirit or in a body. I don't really know what happened. I'm just telling you, I saw things that cannot be described. I saw things I cannot even utter. He, he caught a glimpse of eternity. I'm envious. Then he writes this. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. So, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that he's talking about, he got from God. Ephesians 3, 2. He, he, was, he received the dispensation of God's grace. Excuse me. He was taught three years in the desert about the gospel of Christ. He's actually brought the gospel understanding thoroughly and completely to the other apostles. So to keep, to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. The word ha harass here is a weak word, really, in the Greek New Testament. It's a word in the, I'm sorry, in the English translation. The Greek speaks very strongly. It means to strike with a fist, to beat to be brutally treated. The present tense suggests it's, uh, the, the, this is happening as we speak. In other words, this thorn that Paul dealt with was still a thorn that he was dealing with. It didn't go away. It was a daily thing he wrestled with. It was a daily enemy that he had to combat. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me, but he said, Paul, no, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me read you verse 10 in the Amplified Bible. So I am well pleased with weaknesses, with insults and distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, 
truly drawing from God's strength. Paul found he had grace for the thorn. It doesn't mean he liked the thorn. It didn't mean he thanked God for the thorn. It didn't mean he embraced the thorn. Ever do that? Ever hug a thorn? <laughs> Wouldn't be hit. No, none of those things. He sees, but he knew the thorn was part of his life. God was not going to remove it. And he says, I have grace for this thorn. So think with me here just for a moment, then I'll get into my 19-point message. <laughs> Paul goes to the Arabian Desert. He's taught the grace of God by the Holy Spirit. He teaches it. God, God teaches him personally the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus, of his son, Jesus Christ. Then he sees the revelations of, of, of heaven and the things that God sees them. He, he has this dispensation given to him. He's the man. He plants churches everywhere he goes. People are raised from the dead when they, they fall asleep during his preaching. That's never worked for me, so don't fall asleep. <laughs> if you go, I'm not raising you up. You're dead. So it's, it's, it's way, one way to keep you awake anyway. And, uh, and so, but, but then, then God comes and says, you know, Paul, I've taught you all that I can teach you through theology, through the scriptures, through my, my wisdom. I've taught you all these things, but now there's something I need to teach you that you can't learn in the books. You can't learn it in a class. You can't learn it in a Bible college. I can't teach you this by just giving you the information. I'm giving you this thorn because this thorn will teach you something, Paul, that you have no other way of learning without the thorn. I, can't, I, I want to do this deep work inside of you that only a thorn can do. I could tell you about it. I could point it to you. You can't obedience your way to it. You can't churchianity your way through it. There's only one way. It's that thorn. See, our churchianity, our friend, my friends, can't reach this deep. This is life. Now, I'm going to back up for a moment. I'm just going to again insert my situation here. I don't care what I'm being taught. I want my daughter back. Okay, don't think that I'm like, oh, I'm learning something here. I don't care what I'm learning. Sounds really arrogant and mean. Well, I'm just telling you, I'm being, I'm telling you, I'm going to be really raw with you. I don't know one parent in the world that's lost a child is so happy that they're learning something from God. I don't know of somebody who's had a spouse for 40 or 50 years that lost their spouse. I'm so happy I lost my spouse so God can teach me deep and wonderful things. It's nothing we'd ever choose it's put on us. It doesn't mean it's not punishment. It's, Paul wasn't being punished. It's not paying back for anything. You know what it is? I don't know. I don't know why God allows it to happen to some and not others. I don't know. I know that he'll never give us something that's going to fry us and bring us to a point of no return. I know that. Scriptures promises me that. So when this is life, my friends, this is, we can't, our religion can't do this. This isn't the flat tire. I'm being tested. I got a flat tire. Oh, I'm, I'm being, oh, or I have financial pressure. I don't know where my electric bill is coming from. I'm in a trial. And I'm not saying it's not a trial. I'm not saying it's not real pressure. My spouse, my marriage, and whatever it is. And that may be very real and very true, but sometimes just a little humility and meekness and forgiveness will fix that. Just a little. I'm talking about stuff that's ripped out of your life. It's the doctor's report that you weren't expecting. It's the divorce that came out of nowhere. It's the loved one who is now gone. What does it mean when I'm weak, I'm strong? For me, it means that God has allowed all my earthly ambitions, goals, dreams to die. And I am left 
with him and him alone. I'm not the first one to say this, for me to live as Christ. <laughs> That's what it does. It leaves you with you and Jesus. It doesn't do anything to the horizontal relationships in your life, just makes them more honest and more pure and more sacred. I don't have answers to the why, but let me invite you into my journey to share some of the nuances of my life that I'm beginning to catch the scent of, just the beginning. Some of this will be me getting things off my chest I've been wanting to say for a while. Some of these things will be some of the things the Lord has just taught me. And I'll try to move quickly through it. First point, time does not heal all wounds. It can heal some wounds, maybe, but it does not heal all wounds. Rose Kennedy said this, it's been said time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain in time. The mind protecting its sanity covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens, but it's never gone. Medical medicine would bear that to be true, even though she wasn't a doctor, I don't believe, but medicine would bear what she said to be true. Numerous years ago, maybe a year, a year and a half ago, I was at my daughter's gravesite, and I try to go as much as I can and clean up and put flowers and stuff there. And as I, as I pulled up, there was a woman across the field, a good way, 150, 200 yards away, and she looked elderly. She was elderly, and she had some even more elderly people um, um, there. Now, I don't want to say elderly because people start thinking, you think that's old? Well, that's how old I am. Now, these people, this one was like 150 and, um, and, and, and 160, and the other one was like 102, 103 in that range. So like, anything below that is pretty young anyway. And so now I don't get anyone offended there. So, so we, um, and I, I'm looking, and she's looking at me across the way, staring at me, tapping, uh, which I found out to be her mother, and pointing at me. And I didn't know quite what to think, so I, I just kept doing what I was doing, cleaning up, and they start walking with, with me. They had walkers with little wheels on them, and they're going across open turf, so it was, it was a journey for them. They got to come all the way over. And they came over, and um, she looks at me and says, are you Pastor Kelly? And I said, yeah, I am. Who are you? And, and they gave me their names, which I forgot. And this is my mom and my dad. And this woman was probably legitimately in her early 70s, maybe. And, uh, and they said, I'm so sorry for your loss. I remember it happened. It was just the most tragic, most horrible thing. And she was very, very kind. I said, what brings you here? And she burst into tears. She said, my son. And she pointed over at his grave. My son. I said, I'm so sorry. We all teared up. How long ago did you lose your son? 42 years ago. 42 years. Time does not heal all wounds. Mom was crying. Grandma was crying. Dad was crying 42 years later. Tiffany Bartello, Denis Bartello, I got this off um, Lazani's Facebook page. I thought it was a great quote. No matter what anyone says about grief and about time spent, time healing all wounds, the truth is that there are certain sorrows that never fade away until the heart stops beating and the last breath is taken. My friends, sometimes we simply learn to live with the pain and we learn to live with sadness and we learn to live with grief. I said when I first came back to the pulpit after losing Hannah, I am limping badly. If you want to limp along with me, I would really appreciate it. But I'm not sure when I'm going to stop limping. And I'm probably better at hiding the limp, but the limp remains. just like your limps remain also. We get very good at a public face that you don't quite see as much. One thing I pulled out of that is don't put a time limit on somebody else's pain. You don't get over it. It's been two years. It's been three. It's been 10. It was 42. Should she have been over it? I would be aghast to say she should have. How do you get over missing someone you love? You don't. Loss makes you realize how precious every moment is. Next thing I want to just glean from this first point of 19. 
you do. You, you actually see moments. I find myself now just in a regular life, say he's running around, my wife is there and we're doing, and I, and I remind myself this is a moment I don't want to forget. And I find myself being busy like everybody, but I keep reminding myself I would do anything to have some moments back in my life. Five minutes with my daughter, I would sell everything and live in a box. Five more minutes. I didn't know my mom growing. I knew my mom. She was a great mom. I just didn't know. I was a selfish 19, 20-year-old kid who thought my mom was there to serve me and do everything for me. And I lost her when I was 20. So I never got a chance to know her. She's in heaven now. I'm going to get a chance to know her, but I never got the chance to know her. I would do anything for a few more moments and find out who is my mom really because I knew she cooked and cleaned and treated me nice, spoiled me, went behind my father's back and did things for me, favored me over my brother and my sister. They're watching. <laughs> moments. Last thing, my friends, on this point, give yourself some grace. Don't think you should be on to be on a point that you can't get. Give yourself some grace. If you're grieving for a spouse that you've lost after 30 or 40 or 50 years of marriage and, and you're wondering when's this going to end, just give yourself some grace. If you're grieving your child, give yourself a grace. There is no timetable. There is no stopwatch. There is nobody waiting for you to get through this. Just give yourself some grace. And if people don't want to give you grace, to heck with them. Yeah, it was nice. That was very sanitized. That was very sanitized. That was... That was um, Religious almost, you know, yeah. <laughs> Just give yourself some grace because you need it. This is what he means. My grace is sufficient for you. When I can't do anything, when I'm paralyzed, it doesn't change one bit how God looks at me. He is not tapping his finger, wagging his finger. When are you going to get over this? Come on. No. He walks with us. He walks with us through this grief. Second thing, I have to keep moving here. You really sense that this is not your home. Something I know in my life, I won't spend much time on this. I just realized for me to live as Christ, this isn't my home. I, and I, I, but I look forward to a home to come. My attachment to this world becomes bare thin. Things don't mean anything. Ambitions disappear. Let me read you some verses here. Now let's move on to the next point. These sort of tell the story. Hebrews chapter 11. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to the country they call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Jay, I'm going to skip the third point altogether and just go into the fourth point. So we, we realize that this is no longer, as, especially as we keep losing people, I shared, I think, earlier here, I don't remember now, 29 memorial services in four years. A lot of folks have said goodbye. This is actually the fourth point. I'm skipping the third. You find that the purest type of faith and the most difficult type of faith that I know I've had to confront, Lazani's confronting it, my wife is confronting it, anyone who's lost a child or lost somebody they weren't supposed to lose, the most difficult type of faith is trusting God without answers, without feelings and without direction, while being full of unspeakable pain and confusion. When you say, God, why, and there's no answer, when it doesn't make sense and there's no answer, you beg God and there's no answer, you knock, you seek, you walk, you ask, there's no answer. You have this unspeakable, undefinable pain that is so profound that you can't even breathe sometimes. And you have suffered through a loss of losses. 
the first thing that's going to be attacked is the goodness of God. Just like in, in Genesis chapter 1, the, the devil went to Eve and said, look at, look at God's keeping the best from you, Eve. He attacked the goodness of God to Eve. God is mean. God did not come through. He doesn't care about you. Now, you think, you think that that's, we know that's not true, but you, I'm telling you what you feel. That's your reality. That you serve him, and then he takes the greatest things in your life away. You like Grace 401? It's a hard course. I like 101, 201, 301. Those are good courses. This 401 Grace is, yeah, it's a hard course. This is a battle for God's character and nature. Deep grief, unchecked, will redefine God. Say it again. Deep grief, unchecked, will redefine God. If I don't take this pain, this grief, this heartache, and I'm not careful, it will create a whole new God that won't be loving, that won't be kind, that won't be for me, it'll be against me. So this is the struggle and great loss is keeping God's motives, his nature intact for what they really are, not how our pain makes us think. My friends, you may have to rehearse this, I have. Like a Job, though you slay me, I will yet trust you. God, I know you're good even though I don't understand goodness here. I know you're for me even though I don't understand why you're for me here. I know that you call me, you call me by name. I feel like you've abandoned me, but I'm going to trust what I know through the scriptures. I'm going to trust even though I have no subjective feeling or anything I can hang my hat on to confirm it. You want to talk about great faith? It doesn't get somebody out of a wheelchair. It's not watching a cancerous tumor disappear. It's believing that God is good when you have no evidence that he is. But the scriptures, that's great faith. It's trusting in the character of God, trusting in the nature of God. It doesn't mean the pain goes away. It doesn't mean you accept what's happened to you. It doesn't mean any of those things. You just say, no, God, I know you're good. I know you're for me. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I'll never accept it, but I... Stand here knowing who you are. That is great faith. That doesn't come overnight. When I first lost him, I battled with God. I battled, I battled. I'd be alone, I'd yell at him. Never heard much back. And, I, and then I would repent. I said, God, I'm sorry. I accept this for your will for my life then that would last an hour. <laughs> then I'd go back to, ah, and, uh, and then I'd plead my case again, and I'd repent for another hour. And then he comes back, and it just was just because the emotions were so profoundly painful. They just kept waving, overwhelming me. But now I can say God is good. I don't like what happened to me. I don't think that's good. I don't know why he did it. He hasn't explained that to me. I don't think he will. I wish he never did it. There's no good that came from it that I'd ever, ever, ever exchange. But God is good. It's a journey, Lazani. Takes longer than a year. Takes longer than four. Like I said, it's a journey. Last point. I'm going to quote a dear friend of mine. Dorrance, Dorrance, where are you, Dorrance? I don't don't embarrass you. He loves this saying. He says, everyone loves a happy ending. So I thought I'd just end the message on that. Because people will try their best to find something good about your loss. They, They love a happy ending. They don't want your loss to seem so... Final. They don't want you to be in pain much longer, so they, they try to somehow take your loss and do a spin on it. It's like, a, again, it's a Christian spin zone. To, yeah, like a Christian Bill O'Reilly spin zone there. They use words like at least, or yeah, like at least. That's a good lead in. At least. At least you had all those years with your spouse. At least. 
Look, all the good that's come out of your loss. At least you know they're not long, no longer in pain. How about this one? At least you have other children. At least. What they're really saying is, I want you to feel better so I can feel better. At least. Everyone loves a happy ending. Our pain makes people uncomfortable. It doesn't fit well with their theology sometimes. Here's the problem. There is no happy ending here. There is no happy ending yet. Just like the people in 1 Corinthians, 1 Hebrews chapter 11, their life was not happy. Talk to the 7,100 Christians that were martyred for their faith around the world this past year. These 7,100 Christians that watched their kids killed and their parents killed, ripped from their homeland, ripped from their homes, everything they've worked for lost, all because of um, Muslim extremism. There's no happy ending there. We don't live for this world. And this is what I'm coming my conclusions. We were born to earthly parents as eternal beings. We never taste death. Ever. We're instantly, we leave this world which is passing at best. And we enter this new place which is, which we were made for. That's what we were made for. I wasn't made to die, I was made to live I wasn't made to be depressed. I was made to have joy. I was made to have to have, be happy. I was made to be thorough and complete and healthy. I wasn't made for the disease and destruction of this life. I wasn't made for that. I was made for something higher than that. In the meantime, we groan and we wait and we knock and we seek. We draw near to God the best we know how. We give ourselves grace when we just need grace. Some of the most humble, godly, sweet, spiritual people in the world have suffered the most. There is no way to chart it. Our losses are shrouded up in the mysteries of God, in the mysteries of his plan, in the mysteries of his love. But I have this hope, and this word hope, and I'll close with this. This Bible word hope is not the same as our English word hope. Jeanette hopes. She wins the lottery. You hope. But I don't think she expects to, but she hopes she does. I hope she does too, because she'll give me some. <laughs> and it would be her sin, not mine. I'd just be receiving the gift. So. <laughs> so, so. A, a biblical hope means I really fully expect to receive it. It's not just something I mean, I hope this is, I'm going to bet on this. No, it's a biblical hope says, I expect to receive this. This is going to happen. As good as I'm standing here, I expect a better home. I expect a better life. I expect a, a, a better country. I expect that this world isn't all there is. And I expect that the last moment, the last breath that I breathe here on earth, my very next breath, will be in the presence of Jesus Christ and the people that I love. So we have this forward glance to a home yet realized. As David Crowder sang the last song, earth has no sorrow, then heaven can't heal. That's where we live. It doesn't make the pain go away. Helps you think through it. Helps you find grace for the moment. But I know that earth has no sorrow, that heaven won't heal. Jesus, thank you for these words and these precious people here. As we do every service here um, at Grace Connection, we'd like to give you an opportunity not to join our church in any way, but to not to single you out in any way, but to join the family of God. In the quiet place of your heart, in your own way, your own words, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, salvation's a free gift. It's extended to the human race. All you do is ask for it. 
Jesus Christ proposed marriage to the human race in John 3, 16. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should never perish but have everlasting life. He so loved us that he gave his son, Jesus, that whosoever, anyone that believes on him, believes that he is who he says he was, the son of God, and would do what he said he would do, die on a cross and pay for our sins, resurrect and ascend, and sit back down at the right hand of the Father. Believe that. And the word of God says, Jesus says, you'll live forever. You'll never taste death. And I'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. In your own way, your own words, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, just ask him in. In your own way, your own words. And let one of us know after church, just whisper, I ask Christ into my heart today. I just want to pray for you. Father, there is a lot of grief right in our congregation. There are folks that have lost long-term spouses. There are numerous folks that have lost their dear children. There are folks that have gone through many miscarriages. They have lost their parents. Father, I just pray that somehow today that we our hearts grow a little fonder, just a little fonder, as we look forward with a glance towards heaven and understand that this is not the best there is. This is not what life is about. We have yet to experience what real life is. So, Father, heal my heart, heal my family, and heal those that are here with us this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
want to thank you for being here this morning. Two quick things I'd like to say. Number one, someone asked me last night why I love this church. This is why I love this church, because it's real. It's real. Grace is preached here in such a way that it peels off the veneer of life and allows us to plumb the depths of God like we never probably would. And for that, I'm grateful. Second thing I want to say is this. Thank you for being here to support our pastor and his family. He... Many of you know this, some of you don't. The guy has a a valve that he opens up every day and pours his life out for us. Ways you can't see, ways you can't measure. And you being here today with an open heart and arms that want to help hold this family up mean everything. So he would never say this, but I'm saying this. Thank you so, so much for being here because this is real Christianity. This is what it's all about. So thank you so very, very much. And then finally, two quick things. Uh, Today and today only, we're going to receive our offering at the door. So um, please, on the way out, if you could um, be generous to the work of God here in this community. And then finally, as you go out, you'll see there's these masses of balloons. And um, what we would like you to do is take a balloon. There'll be a Sharpie outside. Write the name of a loved one or loved ones that you have lost proceed out behind the educational building here behind the coffee shop in the back parking lot and we'll gather out there and then we'll let those balloons go and the first service balloons are already in Puerto Rico the wind blew them so far so we'll see where these will go okay so would you pray with me as the ushers are at the back door thank you so much father for this morning and the depths of love that you have expressed here through what we heard and my prayer is that There's so many here that are carrying deep wounds that you would just, the balm of Gilead would just penetrate and heal and soothe and, and, and bathe today. And we thank you that you allowed, um, a topic to be opened up that is sometimes so difficult and allowed us to peer and see, um, just how you think and how you feel and how you work in these situations. So we just love you, we praise you, we, we just, we adore you, Jesus, and we thank you so much. It's in your name we ask these things and dismiss this auditorium today. Amen.